the things of the, of the salvation and the end of the world. So all of these are passages which clearly are used in the New Testament to apply to Jesus and the gospel and the, and the things we're dealing with. But Psalm 2 verse 9 speaks about the Son of God who is given an inheritance. And it says, uh, you shall break the wicked with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Broken pottery. It's like you take a, a, a vase or you take a, a clay pot and smash it on the ground or a concrete surface and just smash the smithereens. He says here, that's what Jesus will do with the wicked. And in verse 12, do homage to the Son. Did He not become angry and you perish in the way? Uh, perish, uh, if we take it in its usual meaning, means destroyed and gone. If we go to Psalm 110, one of the most... Uh, famous messianic passages in the Old Testament, one we'll talk about tomorrow in some detail. Psalm 110 says that the Lord God has made His Messiah, Jesus, uh, to sit at His right hand in verse 1 until His enemies are made a footstool for His feet. And then He speaks of the judgment of the Lord in the last day at verse 5. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings in the day of His wrath. He will judge among the nations he will fill them with corpses. He will shatter the chief men over a broad country. Next slide. The prophetic picture here is battlefield corpses. The Lord will fill the land with corpses. And when you see a land full of corpses, you don't picture people suffering and torment. You picture people who are dead and gone. This is just one picture. It's not the whole story, but it's one picture. And we need to add it to our big picture to get an overall picture. Next slide, please. If we go to Isaiah chapter 11, this is another Messianic passage. Nearly the whole part of the first 10 or 11 verses of Isaiah 11 are quoted in the New Testament and applied to Jesus. Uh, but Isaiah 11 speaks about the judgment of the wicked and makes a statement in verse 4 that Jesus with righteousness will judge the poor. And then the end of the verse, He will strike the earth with the rod of His mouth, with the breath of His lips. He will slay the wicked. And again, the picture is one of destruction, death, slaying the wicked. Next slide. Isaiah 66, 24. The passage from which the famous worms in fire come. The worm that dies not in the fire that is not quenched comes out of this passage of Scripture. Isaiah 66. I want to start a little bit earlier in the chapter. At verse 18, it says that the... Uh, the, the, the people of the world will come and see God's glory. And then he come down to, uh, to verse 22. And he speaks of the new heavens and the new earth in which God's people will live uh, eternally. And then verse 24 says, They, the saved who live in the new heavens and new earth, they will go out and look on the corpses of the men whom the Lord has slain who have transgressed against me. For their worm will not die and their fire will not be quenched and they will be an abhorrence to all flesh. This is a picture of, of something that actually existed. If you go to Jerusalem, outside Jerusalem there's a valley called the Valley of the Sons of Hinnom. And it's later called Gehenna, which means the, 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 the land of Hinnom. Uh, and this Gehenna came to be, during the time between the Testaments, used as a code word for the final punishment of the wicked. But this was like an old-fashioned city dump. Some of you who are as old as I am may remember old-fashioned city dumps before we got sanitary about all that. And you could go out there and enjoy shooting rats or smelling rotten garbage or dead animals. Or, and it's not a big blazing furnace. It's a smoldering fire. If it rains, it just kind of goes underground and it comes back again. It's just this fire that doesn't go out. It just keeps burning and burning and burning. But it's destroying whatever's put in it. And besides the fire, there's sometimes dead animals. And if you look closely, they're just crawling with maggots. And that's a horrible sight also. But fire and maggots is a picture of a city dump. And what's happening is the dead stuff is being consumed by the fire and the worms until there's nothing left because they're just devouring it and devouring it. And they don't stop till it's all gone. That's the picture in Isaiah 66. The saved will go out and look on the city dump, so to speak, uh, the Gehenna outside Jerusalem, and they see the corpses of the wicked and their worm doesn't die and the fire is not quenched. And they shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. It means they will be a repulsive sight. It's disgusting. It makes you want to throw up. It's not horrifying. It doesn't make you feel sorry for somebody. It makes you want to get out of there because it's a disgusting view. And so it's a picture that's very clear if we start here and read this passage and say, what does this picture 
Nobody, even people who teach the traditional view, nobody says this picture here in Isaiah pictures anything other than what I've just described. All right, next slide. The last book of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4. Uh, Malachi pictures in the first four verses there the final end of the wicked. I'm breaking in a new Bible and the pages don't turn. I had a choice of bringing my old Bible and looking pious i bring my new Bible and look at Prosperous, and I decided to go with Prosperous. Uh, Malachi chapter 4. The day is coming, verse 1, burning like a furnace. All the arrogant and evildoers will be chaff, and the day that is coming will set them ablaze, said the Lord of hosts. It will leave them neither root nor branch. Well, if you have a tree and you cut it down and you leave neither root nor branch, what's left? Not anything. It's all gone. And that's the way the fire of God will leave the wicked. Then verse 3, the saved will tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day I'm preparing, says the Lord. Ashes under the soles of your feet. Nothing left but ashes. You will just walk over what used to be the wicked. All of these figures are symbolic. I don't believe any of them is literal. I don't believe the streets of gold are literal. This is all picture language that's trying to tell us something we can understand. Because if God showed us the real thing... It's so much different from anything we've ever experienced and better and transcend that we couldn't even begin to comprehend it. So he uses language we can understand to say it'll be something like this. Well, what will hell be like? We don't know exactly. And I don't have any, any detailed description of it in my mind either. But I know it'll be something like this, that it'll be kind of like when a candle burns up. It'll be kind of like when smoke disappears. It'll be kind of like when a slug melts. It'll be something like when straw burns. It'll be something like a city dump with the worms and fire devouring till nothing is left anymore. It'll be something like ashes under the soles of your feet. But what all of those things tell me is they, the wicked won't be here anymore. They'll be completely destroyed. The devil will be completely destroyed too, I believe, although there's a question mark on that part. And, and in the end, there will be nothing left but righteousness in a new universe of new heavens and new earth where in dwells righteousness and God's kingdom will be everlasting and be all-inclusive. So these are, these are the pictures in the Old Testament. But in our time that's left here this morning, next ten minutes, we're going to zip through the New Testament. Next slide, please. The New Testament starts, of course, with Matthew, which is the next book in your Bible after Malachi, but it's 400 years later. And we have John the Baptizer, who is preaching repentance in chapter 3 of Matthew, and he speaks about Jesus, who will be the judge of the world, and says this about him in verse 12. His winnowing fork is in his hand. He will thoroughly cleanse his, his flesh, threshing floor. He will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Well, if, he, if it's unquenchable fire, we'll see in a moment that means fire that cannot be resisted. And so it does what fire does unless you put the fire out. And what the fire does if you don't put the fire out is it keeps burning until everything's burned up. And that's exactly what he says here. He will burn up the chaff. With unquenchable fire, it will be burned up because the fire can't be put out, and it keeps burning until there's nothing left. So they're burned up and they're gone. And that seems very clear on the face of it. Next slide, please. The teaching of Jesus himself, uh, three examples. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, Jesus says, Fear God who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. What does it mean to destroy the body? Everybody has a clear picture of that. What does it mean to destroy the soul? Well, it ought to mean the same thing. Fear God who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. God will destroy the whole person. There won't be anything left, and there won't be anything left forever. And that's eternal punishment. It's everlasting punishment. It's eternal destruction. That's what Jesus here says will take place. In our third lesson this morning, we'll see how Tertullian, one of the early church fathers, dealt with this passage and turned it around to mean the exact opposite and why he did that. But for right now, we just want to notice what Jesus said. Matthew 9, 43 through 48, Jesus is warning his disciples to exercise self-control so that uh, it's better to lose an eye or lose a limb than to have the whole body be cast into hell. And then in and, and the uh, probably better manuscripts of the Greek here, it, uh, in verse 48 it says, where their worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. In the King James Version, that phrase is plugged in three or four other places earlier in the same passage, but that's not in some of the better manuscripts. But it's there at least one time, and maybe there several times. Jesus says that this will be a time when when their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Well, what does that mean? 
Well, you guys are smarter than a lot of people out there in other church buildings this morning or tomorrow morning because you already understand that's a quotation from Isaiah 66, 24. You've got an advantage on people that don't know that. When they hear that, they just have to say, huh, what does it mean? Worm that dies not and fire is not quenched. And they have to figure out something. So they end up with all kinds of strange theories that mean the wicked to live forever and are suffering torment. But, but if we know that Isaiah 66, 24 is where this comes from, we can turn over there and say, what does this picture? And I say, my goodness, it's pretty clear, isn't it? It pictures the corpses of those whom the Lord has slain who are thrown out in the city dump where there's maggots and smoldering fire that consume until nothing is left. And that's what Jesus means here, because he doesn't say, well, it used to mean that, but now it means something different. It still means what it used to mean. And then finally, this very wonderful passage, John 